Bien, empecemos. Esta va a ser una conversación en español y en inglés. This is gonna be a conversation in English and in Spanish. Pueden escuchar la conversación original en este canal en el que están ahora. You can listen to the original version of this conversation in the channel you are in now. Pero también van a tener interpretación al inglés, al español y al portugués, así que se pueden conectar al canal que mejor les funcione a ustedes. You will have interpretation into English, Spanish and Portuguese. So do connect to the channel that works better for you. Para quien desee escuchar la presentación en inglés o en portugués, van a ver un icono en su pantalla que se llama interpretación. Basta con hacer un clic allí y seleccionar English o Portuguese. Uh, you will find an icon on your screen that says interpretation. If you click this icon, you will have the opportunity to choose English or Spanish and listen to the conversation in the language you prefer. Ahora voy solo en español. Vamos a silenciar todos los micrófonos porque somos muchas personas conectadas y así la calidad del sonido es mejor. Vamos a dejar también 15 minutos al final para preguntas que las pueden ir mandando desde ya ahora en el chat, así las clasificamos. También le quiero dar la bienvenida a nuestros socios del Fondo de Innovación para la Primera Infancia que han apoyado en la organización de este webinar, la Fundación FEMSA, la Fundación María Cecilia Souto Vidigal y Open Society Foundation. Bienvenidos. Antes de dejarlos con Marcelo Cabrol, el gerente del sector social, quien va a moderar este panel, déjenme presentar brevemente a los tres grandes ponentes de esta conversación. Timothy Robertson es un profesor en John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health en los Estados Unidos. María José Castro Rojas es la subsecretaria de Educación Parvularia en Chile. Y Susan Walker es la directora del Caribbean Institute of Health Research en la Universidad de West Indies en Jamaica. Bienvenidos a los tres y les dejo entonces con Marcelo que va a moderar este panel. Muchas gracias Florencia, gracias a vos y a todo el equipo del banco que ha hecho posible esta conversación. Eh, voy a seguir con las gracias porque son debidas, eh, gracias a nuestros socios eh, en el Fondo de la Primera Infancia, eh, estamos muy contentos de tenerlos como coorganizadores de esta conversación y eh, muchas gracias a los tres panelistas. Eh, Tim, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Susan, uh, the, same, the same, and I don't know if María José is already online or not, but María José, bienvenida. Uh, let, let me start with, with uh, a little bit of a provocation, uh, a little bit of a news item that we saw in the Washington Post. Uh, uh, I don't know, Pablo, if you can put it uh, there on the screen. Uh, this article by the Washington Post uh, it started all sorts of conversations here in the U.S. Uh, and around uh, the globe. In, so uh, as you can see there, uh, what... Uh, The article says it's about uh, the possibility of, uh, of uh, an outbreak, actually, in mortality rate for, for small children. Um, what I read there, it's, uh, you know, <clears throat> that, that would be for the first time in 60 years that we have this kind of uh, global outbreak. And uh, Tim, I saw there that uh, 118 countries uh, studied and 1.2 million children that could die Uh, before their fifth birthday in the next six months. Uh, and that's the consequences of the COVID. Um, so what I want to ask you is, uh, first of all, give me a little bit more of that and tell me what the consequences are and what we can do about it. Okay, th thanks Marcelo and thanks for inviting me to participate in this, uh, this webinar. So we know from our experience with um, past outbreaks, past uh, pandemics, that people obviously have health issues because of the virus itself. People get sick, in this case, people getting sick from COVID uh, itself. But um, from our experience, we also know that people get sick as well from the secondary effects of an outbreak or an, a pandemic. So in this case, people are getting sick from COVID, but we can imagine that people will also be sick because they are unable to access their regular health services, right? And so in our model or in our thinking, we imagine that two things might be happening for children. So for children, you know, the, the kind of case fatality rate for, for kids, and in fact, the infection rate for kids is lower than for adults and other age groups, but kids might be particularly susceptible to, to health effects because they haven't been able to get ordinary care. 
So for us, we consider two things. First, that people who might ordinarily go and get care when a, a child is sick. So if I, if I have a family and my child is sick, maybe ordinarily I would be able to go to a health facility and get care if my child has pneumonia or potentially dehydration or other issues, I can go get care. But because of the pandemic and lockdowns, disruption of services, maybe those children cannot now get care. And the same thing for, for newborn kids. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps a mother who's having an obstetric complication might be able to get care for that complication in childbirth. But maybe now because of the pandemic, she's not delivering in a facility or she's unable to get tertiary care if she needs it. So that's one thing we model. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was the potential issue of what we call um, wasting or undernutrition. Now this may not be as relevant for Latin America countries as it is for maybe Sub-Saharan Africa or other parts of the world. But one thing we wanna be careful of is, you know, given all the socioeconomic disruption uh, because of the pandemic, perhaps there'll be an increase in food insecurity so more people more families won't be able to get the food that they need and if children are undernourished then they are more at risk of dying from infectious diseases so more likely to die from pneumonia or from measles or from other for other issues so those are the two things that we sort of see potentially happening and we we ran a few models to kind of imagine what might be possible under those situations and like you said we found that in a in a kind of worst case scenario or at least what looked to be for us as a worst case scenario in back in April, we thought that over a six month period, if there are disruptions of around 40 to 50% of health services disruptions, then that might lead to, to about 200,000 children dying per month around the world. And over six months, that would be 1.2 million children. Do you know if this is typical of a pandemic situation? Well, it's, Yes, I mean, we, we have experience of this, as I said, I think in particular, if you look at the Ebola outbreak, 2014, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. saw that um, utilization of health services went down dramatically, in some cases, as you know, to, to almost half of what it was, or even less than half of what it was. And that, that led to increased death. And, in, and some people, some researchers say that more people died in the Ebola outbreak from not from Ebola, but from, you know, not being able to get maternal and child care than they did from Ebola itself. So that's, that's one thing. But the other thing is, you know, this pandemic is quite unique. I mean, it's unique in terms of scale and impact. So certainly in the last 50 years. Um, so I think to some extent we're in uncharted territory here, but, but we right. do have good evidence to believe that disrupt, if disruption happens, it can have severe consequences. Great team. Uh Susan, let, let, let me put you here uh, on the spot with, with this. I mean, at the beginning of the outbreak, uh, the conversation was, you know, uh, COVID is not as uh, prevalent or fatal for small kids. Uh, so we forgot quite a bit about, <clears throat> you know, that part of the conversation. How do you see this issue of postponement of care, especially for, for kids and their mothers in this critical age? Is that happening, something that you see happening? Um Yes, um, I think, I think Marcelo, one of the things I'd like to do is maybe place the situation as to where we were even before the pandemic. Right. And so we know that before that, before, before the pandemic, we, there were already we estimates that 43% of children under five were not developing as they should um, due to poverty and other associated risks such as stunting and lack of stimulation. And so, and these deficits in development begin in the first year of life. And by the time these children get to school, the differences by socioeconomic status are, are very large. Uh, so the other point before we talk about um, how things have changed is that um, families, are, we need to understand that families are the most important providers of care at this age. So particularly for the children, for children under three, Mm -hmm. um, and so what, whenever we think about how children will be Im impacted, we have to think about the family because they're the ones who are really providing the environment for small children and also mediating and potentially buffering or protecting children. So in terms of the impact of COVID, 
I think as Tim has said, obviously not accessing routine healthcare is an important thing. Um, the other obvious um, impact is the economic impact of, of lockdown and um, low wage people are the most likely to have lost their jobs. And the, these families who are already at risk are the least able to withstand the shocks. Correct. So they don't really have um, any, much savings. They have few assets to sell. Um, and so food insecurity is likely to, to rise. Um, and the, the UNICEF did an estimate er, early on in the pandemic in April, mm -hmm. um, in which they estimated that between 42 to 66 more mi million more children were going to be in extreme poverty than before the pandemic. <clears throat> And this translates to at least about another 20 to 25% increase in the numbers of children at risk. So we had, a hu had huge numbers of children at risk before, and what the pandemic has done is increased the numbers of children at risk and also made the families already at risk even more vulnerable. And it, it, super interesting. Let me so contrast what Tim says with what you said. Tim said maybe this, it might be, and I want to put it in, in the right context, <laughs> it might not be a problem for Latin America and the Caribbean, the issues of nutrition and undernourishment and that kind of stuff. Uh, so you, you talk here about uh, families under stress. So I want to ask you two questions. The first of all, it's, you know, especially the issue of uh, feeding and proper feeding and caring and, and how we're doing this and that, whether you see any impact or not coming from the COVID. My answer is, I guess, is yes, but I want to hear you. And the second one is, we talk a lot about stress in the economic side, but when it comes to take care of children, the psychological issues of, uh, you know, losing a job or not having enough food or, or even being uh, locked down uh, starts to be a, an issue when you're taking care of, of kids. Can you make a, you know, a contrast there? Okay, so if we talk, look at the nutrition aspect first, um, I think we will all expect that um, food insecurity will rise. Mm -hmm. um, that may have an impact on, on wasting. I, the cri more critical aspect for children's development is the impact it may have on rates of stunting, which have, mm. have, have begun to decrease quite considerably in Latin America and the Caribbean. And what we may find is that that, that decrease at least stops, starts, stops and it, and we may even see increases. So that has particular implications for, um, for, for, for children's well-being. And I'm, I mean, I'm really glad you brought us back to the family because what families are, find are, in, are having now is a situation where they have increased stress. So they, mm -hmm. have, they themselves may be stressed or have, be, have suffered getting depressed. Um, there's the possibility that a family member may be seriously ill or, or, or even they, they may face death of either the family's main breadwinner or devastating for the child, the death of his, prime, his or her primary caregiver. And then also, I think, which we haven't really raised is the issue that people are, are increasingly saying is that there's an increase in, in violence within the home because mm. everybody's crammed in the home and, um, sir, and this where, where, where the per person in the home was already prone to, prone to violence, it's just increases. So that there's an increase in intimate partner violence and also violence towards children. So there are a lot of extra stresses on families. And at the same time, they're faced with reductions in support. So some of the services that they might have turned to in the past might not be so easily available. Some of the, the care for their children, particularly those children who went to preschool or were in daycare, those have all been suspended. And the programs um, like the one that I'm most involved in, um, where, which reached out to parents and I, either through home visits or through groups um, to provide them with some support around how to care, protect and promote the, their child's development. Those are also pretty much on hold. So families are in a kind of a, a double, it's, you know, it's a really difficult situation. It's a difficult situation. Gone up and where their support has gone down. Susan, uh, thank you very much. I, I'm going to probe whether uh, uh, Maria Jose is with us or not here connected. Maria Jose, are you there? Florencia? Sí, estoy acá. Ah, hola, Maria Jose, ¿cómo te va? 
¿Me escuchás? Bien, un poco, un poco de espacio. Un poco de espacio. Ahí sí, eh, ahí sí. Ok, perfecto. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. Bienvenida. Eh, María Gracias. José, no sé cuánto pudiste escuchar de la conversación hasta ahora, eh, pero me gustaría que, que, que hagas una reflexión sobre todos estos temas que hemos tratado. Tanto el tema que Tim levanta, como los temas que Susan está levantando, tanto desde el punto de vista de los chicos por, por su lado, y la familia por su lado, y como conjunto. Bueno, eh, he estado todo, todo el rato conectada, así que he podido escuchar a ambos. Eh, lamentablemente estamos viviendo una situación que no nos permite hoy día eh, decir algo muy distinto en el sentido de algo más esperanzador. Sí, nosotros efectivamente creo, y quienes trabajamos en educación, eh, hemos vivido eh, y, y conocemos tal vez la historia bien de la educación y de, lo, de las distintas dificultades que ha vivido el mundo, Sabemos que la educación es un medio formidable para salir adelante y estamos convencidos que, eh, que podremos rearmarnos para salir. Sin embargo, hoy día eh, hay aspectos preocupantes que vemos nosotros en nuestro país, especialmente en la educación de los más pequeños, de la primera infancia. Por una parte, vemos un aumento de... O sea, va a disminuir brutalmente la matrícula en estos niveles. Ya ha disminuido comparativamente en un 10%. Eh, nosotros proyectamos que de aquí a agosto la disminución puede ser de un 15%. Y sabemos que es probable que aunque en algún momento este año se vuelva a generar algún tipo de clases presenciales o actividades presenciales, ese delta de pérdida de matrícula no lo vamos a recuperar. Eso es un, un dato y creemos que es parte de la gravedad. Segundo, perdón, José, también... Sa perdón, ¿sabes por qué? O sea, ¿de dónde viene ese 10-15%? ¿Viene más de en que primer... las familias no quieren mandar a sus hijos o simplemente de la interrupción del servicio? Contame. Aquí pasan dos cosas, Marcelo. Lo primero que ocurre es que a nosotros este, esta crisis eh, nos encontró las primeras, segunda semana de marzo. El sistema, sobre todo en educación parvularia, se termina de consolidar la matrícula durante todo el mes de marzo. Eso es lo que ocurre históricamente. Por lo tanto, ya tuvimos un grupo importante de familias que simplemente no, nunca hicieron, nunca llegaron a matricular. Eso es por un punto. Segundo, eh, nosotros tenemos, de los niños que no asisten a la educación parvularia, un 60% lo hace porque sus familias creen que están mejor en la casa, y dentro de ese que cree que está mejor, hay un nivel alto de desconfianza en general hacia el sistema. Mm. Si bien es cierto, igual tenemos un 50% de niños que asistan a la educación parvular y tenemos un 50% que no lo hace. Eh, entonces esa desconfianza, no hacia el sistema, sino a que los niños se van a enfermar más, eh, que obviamente que no, no van a tener la confianza de que el sistema, cuando volvamos, va a estar totalmente preparado para recibir a los más pequeños. Porque, bueno, todo eso nosotros creemos que va a hacer que efectivamente la matrícula disminuya y la proyección es que en agosto vamos a tener un menos un 15%. Es muy brutal si es que lo miramos en una política pública que ha buscado durante años aumentar la cobertura en la primera infancia, porque estamos convencidos que es la primera infancia donde tenemos que poner la mayor eh, energía, los mayores recursos, todo lo que tengamos disponible, porque si queremos realmente mejorar la educación del país hay que partir acá. De acuerdo. Entonces, nuestro temor hoy día es que se queden ciertas sensaciones, principalmente las de desconfianza de la familia hacia los sistemas educativos en cuanto a cuidado, no en cuanto a calidad, creemos que eso va a ser algo difícil de revertir. Eso por una parte, también por otra parte decir, en, en el país hemos logrado hacer algunas cosas que han sido ejemplo y son bastante extraordinarias, por ejemplo, el lograr llegar con alimentación durante todo este tiempo a las familias. Pero, también a decir verdad, estamos llegando a los niños que están matriculados en la vale, educación popular. Tenemos, por lo tanto... 250.000 niños que no están matriculados y que no han tenido acceso a esta alimentación. Eh, por otra parte, eh, lo mismo nos pasa con, y, y por lo tanto empezamos a, hoy día a ver un problema aquí en Chile 
prácticamente no tenemos que el de la desnutrición o el de la mala alimentación, no es que no lo tengamos, pero está en, en un muy bajo índice. Evidentemente acá eh, creemos que esto es un tema que va a aumentar y eh, todos los institutos de salud pública ya lo están viendo, que puede aumentar la desnutrición uh -huh. y más que nada la mala alimentación. Y eso, por supuesto, es un tema que sabemos... In, in, Coincidiendo eh, tiene, con lo que estaba diciendo Susan un poquito. Con lo, coincidiendo con lo que estaba diciendo Susan, efectivamente, y esto tiene repercusiones en el tema de salud pública, pero también ten, y tiene repercusiones en el tema de aprendizaje posterior, en fin. Entonces nosotros vemos con mucha preocupación... Eh, no quiero decir desesperanza, porque yo espero que los que están oyendo hoy día también quieran escuchar de nosotros, eh, no sé, cómo, cómo hacemos para levantarnos, pero, de acuerdo. pero esto es, hoy día eh, son noticias complejas. Eh, recién ayer el presidente anunció una posibilidad de que los padres que tienen niños en edad preescolar se puedan acoger voluntariamente a la ley de protección del empleo para que puedan cuidar a sus niños, porque también, claro. junto a lo que claro. decían Tim y Susan, ha crecido o ha aumentado al interior de la familia la violencia intrafamiliar, problemas psicológicos, madres, sobre todo eh, eh, probablemente con una salud mental más deteriorada que la que iniciaron al principio de la pandemia. Eh, bueno, todo lo que, lo que está Super. concurriendo. Así es que Super. esos son nuestros desafíos, Marcelo, por ahora. Gracias, María José. Susan, uh, do, you, ¿do you see also uh, the lack of confidence, the, the lack of trust? Uh, the from the families when time comes to send their kids back to preschools or, or, or uh, elementary schools? Do you see that as a factor? How much fear is going to prevail over, you know, the need to actually rejoin the service? Sorry, I... <laughs> Was that a question for me? I'm sorry. It was a question for you, Susan. Yeah. He was still talking. So, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I, I, yes, I think um, there may be some fear, um, but then also there will be the, the, the pull, particularly in Jamaica, it's, we have a very high percentage of those out over three who do go to preschool. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because of the, the that, that, expectation in the population that children from three should go to school that probably they they will they will return that's going to prevail yeah for me i i, I would, would like to kind of maybe switch the focus to those i think that that, that um were referred to as being not yet in accessing those services and um really how do we find ways to continue to support and um protect those families And that services for families and um, home visiting services and group services for families to try and improve parenting were, already, were beginning to increase in Latin America. And um, now pretty much they've, they've been suspended. We need to find ways to continue to reach the families. Um, we can, you know, and so when we have a well-established uh, parenting program called ReachUp, which we built on um, our evidence base and the evidence from others of how effective these parent parenting programs can be. And we've shown they have long-term impacts into adulthood. And um, in conversation with Florencia, we were discussing the need for um, guidance for many, many agencies who were looking for what, what, what could they do now for With the children who were at home. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was adapt our program and develop a parent manual. So for, for previously to this, the training was always mediated by somebody, somebody <clears throat> the group or a community health worker. And now we were thinking of, well, is it possible to directly reach families, to give the material directly to the families? Is that possible? Uh, Yeah, and, and so we, we create, what we've created is a, a parent manual, mm -hmm. um, which uses selected materials from the, the wider curriculum, particularly focusing on those that are a bit simpler, and also those that don't use many materials or use things that the parents are likely to have in the home. And so we put that together, together with some guidance for them on how to help the children feel safe and happy, and a few tips around looking after their own well-being. Um, so we've, we've 
we've published that on our website and the IDB translated that into Spanish and into Portuguese and that's now available on the IDB website. I think they're going to put something about that in the chat. <laughs> you, you are ahead of me, you know, next time you moderate because you're doing this so well. Uh, but you're ahead of me. Yeah, that's, that's the idea to put it there. Yeah. So, but but let, me, let, me, let me ask you, Susan, uh, you know, let, let me be a little bit skeptic here. Okay. So you needed mediation before to provide a good quality, uh, you know, non-center-based non care. And now you don't need it anymore. No, that's not true. <laughs> so what, what we're thinking is that we, we, as we did the manual, we thought, gosh, our parents are going to use this, you know. Um, and, you know, I should, should, should um, just acknowledge my colleague, Susan Chang-Lopez, who really was the person who did most of the work um, to develop the manual. And, and it, herself is maybe the most skeptical, as skeptical as you. <laughs> um, and she, what, what we think is that we could try giving the, the full manual to parents as well as we could select some particular cards, make some cards or printouts from selected pages. But that it's likely that they're also going to need some sort of other support in terms of maybe phone calls or text messages or maybe, um, you know, short videos. I, I, if, I, if I have the time, I'd quite like to talk because there's actually been the materials beginning to be used in some countries and I maybe I could just give you a couple of things that people have, we haven't told them to do that people have thought of doing so for example in Mexico um, as part of Canafe they're developing they're they're doing some printouts mm -hmm. but they're also developing scripts for radio dramas okay two two parents can talk about the activities and the toys and whatever and this is also being developed in Guatemala. Okay. Um, I know that together with <clears throat> the IDB, there's some work in Ecuador, um, again, around making some kind of fiches, I think they call them for, for parents, but also in, in this case, make, doing more around phone calling. So, yeah, so yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to that in a moment. You know, so that kind of thing is, is, is how we see it working. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to that moment because it's super important the idea of multi you know, several platforms used to deliver this content and it's not only printouts or it's not only a, a material uh, a digital material of sort you know or at least internet based material. Tim, let me let me ask you uh, this. Uh, th there is an issue, and I want to clarify this. When you when it comes to time to go to a health service, there is a question of the service not being there. That is to say, you know, provision actually disappears because the stress uh, on the system is so much that uh, the, the, the service is not there. But it's also the conscious decision of the family not to risk it. How do, how do you see that playing and how do we work on those two topics in order to ensure that service is actually provided? Um. I think you're 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 uh, absolutely right. I mean, I mean, you can think about it quite simply in terms of supply and demand. You know, on the supply side, you have the provision of care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are there services available at health facilities or community services? Um, I think on the provision side, there are a number of factors that might be happening. One is with the health workers themselves, so with the personnel. Um, in the early days. Uh, perhaps the personnel were um, diverted to work on COVID or on the pandemic. So they may be kind of moved from their positions. I'm not sure how that is happening in, in Latin America and Caribbean countries. Mm -hmm. um, that could happen. Also, they could themselves get sick. So they're out of the workforce or they might just be distracted because they have their own, um, you know, family to worry about and they, they have their own movement restrictions and stuff. The other part of provision is the, the supplies and, and the equipment. So, you know, can we get the kind of necessary antibiotics or the necessary, you know, anticonvulsants from, from others and things. So the drugs and medicines. So that's all provision. And honestly, um, it's, it's very hard to know what is the, the biggest factor in this. And I think that's maybe the job for countries is to mm -hmm. figure out what are the bottlenecks in their country? What are the issues? And on the demand side, I think, um, as you said, it could be, um, it could be a question of motivation. Maybe people think that you know there every every time a, a family who seeks care you know there's some trade-offs you know thinking about cost thinking about the time it might take 
thinking about, you know, various factors. And I think, you know, the, a pandemic changes the calculus. So we've got to think about, you know, how people's perceptions might have changed or their behaviors. It could be fear. It could be, you know, they don't have enough money to pay for services. It could be just physical movement. So again, I think there are a lot of factors that, you know, we, we kind of need to, to, to consider. Excellent, Tim. So I'm going to switch now to Maria Jose uh, y, y, y después a Susan en la misma pregunta. Eh, María José, eh, yo trabajo bastante en educación, o por lo menos solía trabajar mucho en educación, y estoy leyendo mucho sobre blended education. ¿Quién no en este momento? Eh, siempre terminamos con los chicos de 0 a 6 eh, en la conversación si este tipo de tools funciona o no funciona. Entonces, de, déjame darte una, una amplia puerta ahí para entrar y contarnos qué pensás de este tipo de educación híbrida, eh, ¿Es posible realmente trabajar con medios digitales, remotos, eh, para estimulación y aprendizaje para los chicos más chiquitos? Eh, te pido una reflexión sobre eso y tu, tu experiencia misma. Eh, gracias, porque me pones en un tema que eh, nos ha tenido todo este tiempo eh, muy desafiado, que precisamente lo nuestro es lograr aprendizaje y desarrollo profundo en esta etapa. En primer lugar, creo que los niños nos han demostrado una vez más ser más dúctiles, más flexibles de lo que nosotros como adultos lo somos. Eh, y por lo tanto, creo que eh, en una medida muy distinta a la de niños más grandes, hay posibilidades de, algún, eh, de algunas herramientas eh, que permiten este blended learning. Eh, deben ser muy acotadas en el tiempo de exposición, muy acotadas en lo que queremos lograr, evidentemente. ¿Qué hemos visto? Hemos visto, por ejemplo, que las apps, nosotros hoy día estábamos impulsando desde el año pasado una app, que es la app Mi Jardín, para todos los establecimientos, donde el niño muy eh, intuitivamente, ¿verdad?, puede llegar fácilmente a un cuentacuentos, a una actividad así muy breve, bien diseñada, donde el niño puede conectarse. Tenemos otra app que es en inglés, para el aprendizaje en inglés hoy día, que, que nos, nos la propusieron, nos la prestaron gratuitamente, que es la Joint English School, o Joint School English. Eh, y claro, siempre y cuando estamos hablando de tiempos muy acotados, los niños mm. pueden interactuar con una herramienta de ese tipo. Pensar que los niños con autonomías van a obtener recursos de, de, un, de un sitio web es mucho más complejo y ahí se requiere de los padres. Por eso que lo que nosotros hemos hecho acá es eh, de alguna manera cargar, o sea, cargarle de alguna manera la mano a los papás en este tiempo. Mm. Primero porque el desarrollo de los niños no se detiene. Entonces es muy duro que los niños en este periodo queden rezagados y en las familias donde hay niños más grandes, solamente sean los grandes los que estén, entre comillas, tratando de aprender algo y los más pequeños nada. Por eso que hemos impulsado mucho estrategia para apoyar a los padres y procurar que en la rutina del día se incorpore espacios específicos para los más pequeños, entendiendo que... Eh, requieren de mucha conversación. Una de las cosas que nosotros vemos hoy día con un poco también de preocupación es que en los hogares más vulnerables, y esto debe pasar en, todo, en todos los países, el lenguaje se ve muy deteriorado o sufre mucho porque sabemos que tienen mucho menos eh, interacción con un buen lenguaje, con padres o madres que estén estimulando en los niños un mayor desarrollo de palabras, eh, que les cuenten historias, etcétera. Es por eso que hoy día estamos buscando, eh, con orientaciones pequeñas a los padres, con consejos, más bien de buena crianza, que les hablen a los niños, que les nombren las cosas, que fomenten en ellos eh, las preguntas, fomenten en ellos un uso del lenguaje. Los padres son los primeros educadores, pero sabemos que no por eso los padres están... Eh, saben lo que tienen que hacer, por eso que hemos visto la, la, con, mayor, ne, con una mayor necesidad la, 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 la importancia de acompañar a los padres con consejos de buena crianza en cuanto al lenguaje, 
en cuanto a las rutinas de la vida diaria, y eso ha sido muy valorado. Eh, hemos hecho unas orientaciones también para las familias, para que dentro de las rutinas logren incorporar a los más pequeños. Perfecto. También sí. hemos visto que la manera de lograr eh, llegar a los niños en esta época, ya que los niños tienen poco acceso, son poco autónomos, programas radiales, Hoy día estamos impulsando con muchas radios muy locales, que eso es lo que más nos gusta en el fondo para llegar a todo el país, cuentacuentos y podcasts pequeñitos, cortitos, tanto directamente para los niños como también para ayudar a los padres, con pequeños consejos para los padres. Creemos que la radio hoy día tiene una difusión y un alcance mucho mayor eh, a todos los medios que requieren de internet. Bueno, la televisión también, nosotros el canal TV Educa en Chile, ya está el eh, segundo en sintonía, tiene programación de acuerdo, de acuerdo. todo el día, etc. De acuerdo. Y por otra parte también, efectivamente acá lo que hemos hecho es llegar eh, directamente con material a los niños. La pregunta, si el blended learning es posible en los más chicos, es posible en mucho menor medida que los niños que son más autónomos, y evidentemente mientras más grandes son, es más posible. Los más pequeñitos claramente requieren de un adulto mediador, super. y eso no hay duda y no hay... es super, así. Super. María José, súper claro. Eh, Susan, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to follow up on that, on two points. Uh, the first one is the general statement about hybrid education or blended learning. For the, for the for small kids, whether it's possible or not. But the yeah. second one, it's about evidence. I, I, you know, we, we admire your work for the amount of evidence that we've gotten over the years uh, to, to, to do better policies. So how do we get better evidence? Because this is a new word for us, actually. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, go ahead. I think, I, think I, I would agree um, with that, you know, for, 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 this, for kids this age, what we're really talking about is blended programming for parents. And how do we use different channels to reach out to parents and continue to support them in the way the way they need? Just so, like Maria was saying. Um, so, what what the, I think we can perhaps see an opportunity here. Um, the, the the pandemic has forced us to be more creative, uh, and also it's now an opportunity for us to to learn to learn. So, so some of the questions we have are. Um, can we find out how, how well parents do engage with the material? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, know, you know, do they listen to the radio things? Or are, are, if you hand them out some, uh, uh, um, some, some features, do they actually use them? So we, we need to know how, how much um, and understand why they do or don't engage. And also we, need, we still have facilitators in the picture. So we're still having people who will reach out um, by phone calls, or we're still going to have, try and have radio dramas. So we, and sometimes people are using the internet where, it's, where parents have good access. Uh, so we also need to understand how much additional support those people need, what works, you know, how does it, what works well. So I think it's really an opportunity for us to learn a lot and things, and what we will learn, the lessons will help us because we've been challenged to scale these type of programs effectively and with quality. And maybe what one of the things we can learn here is how we can combine, as you say, blend mm -hmm. the remote contacts with our and technology with the traditional delivery methods that we used before the pandemic to more effectively scale once we're past this initial period. So I think, you know, that would, for me would be the big, the big thing that we should be able to say after, after, after the pandemic. Do, are we going to have, Susan, uh, damages that, I mean, Maria Jose talked about the postponement. I mean, I mean, we are talking about small kids. We always talk about a small window of opportunity that is going to, that's going to last for a lifetime. That's what we say. Uh, so is that something that it's irreversible? I mean, three months. We're, we're talking about at least three months now. We might talk about six months. I don't know. You know. Yeah, I hate to say irreversible, but it sounds. But at the same time, I do think we're faced with the fact that we may have a cohort of children. If we do, unless we're really able to mitigate the, the impact for young children, we may have a cohort of children going forward who, who will have consequences to adulthood. 
Um, I, there has been some work, um, I was reading some work recently, um, recalling some of the follow-ups of previous famines and even the 1918 influenza. Mm -hmm, influenza mm -hmm. pandemic. And they did find impacts for children who, mostly that work was around children, um, around, around um, pregnancy. So the children were in utero at the time of the, the, the shock. But what they, they did find um, long-term impacts in, in adulthood for those children. And we also know that children, very poor children, if you follow them, they have a long-term impact. So I think it's hard to say that there won't be long-term consequences for this cohort. And so that really reinforces why we have to do everything we can um, to mitigate the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on, on this, this age group. Super, Susan. Thank you very much, Tim. We talk about hybrid education quite a bit. Uh, there's been a long discussion about what kind of adaptation we need in the health uh, system in order to especially cover these kids and the families. Uh, uh, you know, we've been talking quite a bit about distance uh, uh, tele telemedicine, I'm sorry, telediagnostics and other stuff. Uh, measles, for example, in the article that we started with the conversation, they said that uh, uh, 117 million children in 37 na nations were at risk of missing their missiles uh, dose, according to the United Nations. So what kind of adaptation do you see uh, in the health systems in order to be prepared for uh, this type of situation? Yeah, I think this, I think exactly as you said, you know, the same ideas of blended, uh, you know, concepts can also be applied to the health sector. And I think the global health community has tried to do a lot of this uh, over the last, you know, 30 years, you know, mobilizing community health workers or lay health workers in villages. So rather than having to travel to a facility and, you know, get seen by an official nurse, you could be seen by someone in your, your village or your community who, who, who understands you and perhaps doesn't have multiple years of training, but could still, you know, give a, a micronutrient supplementation to you or could still provide you with contraception or provide you potentially, um, you know, with vaccination, although, you know, there are different models about how you can use community health workers for vaccination. So I think, I think you're right. I think the, the challenge for policymakers is to understand, you know, how far they're willing to go or how far they should go in terms of pushing some of the delivery of care down to um, sort of community, commu community health workers. Although the same issues apply around the supply chains, you know, can you actually get kind of the products to, to, to community health workers? Um, and, you know, and I think uh, the access issue is only part of this, you know, you still have to get people to, you know, be motivated to seek care and stuff like that. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with the questions from the audience. We have several, several questions and I'm not going to get to all of them, but I'm going to try to be very busy. Susan, uh, I, 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 I'm going to give this one to you, actually. Uh, so uh, what about the psychological cost of, uh, you know, uh, being uh, isolated or not going to schools for both children and parents. Do we have any way of uh, making that clear and, and more understandable for everybody? That's what the first question for Laura Soto here. Um, well, I don't know that we have any, um, whether how much that's been actually measured. Mm -hmm. we, can, mm -hmm. we can all um, think about what it will be like. I mean, we've been experiencing it ourselves. And um, for small children who don't really understand why things have changed, it may be particularly um, stressful. The, what they do have the advantage of is having a parent who can um, do things to, to, to some extent, protect them from it in terms of, you know, trying to maintain, maintain routines and making sure to, you know, to respond to them and, and showing love and those kinds of things. And we did put some, some of those kind of strategies into the manual um, because we think that's almost as, as important, shall we say, as doing the stimulation activities and the language and so on. So, you know, so that, so particularly at this time, providing that sort of buffering for children is really important. Super, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, eh, Maria Jose, Ana Carvajal, aquí. Mm -hmm. Nos, me levanto un tema que me había olvidado, francamente, que es súper importante, que es, eh, hemos hablado de la familia, hemos hablado de los chicos, pero no hemos hablado de los que proveen estos servicios. 
¿sí? maestros eh, y, y, y gente que está en el front line de esta conversación. Y lo que dice Ana esencialmente es, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué pasa cuando los maestros están llenos de temor? O sea, tienen miedo de lo que les va a pasar. ¿no? Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Qué están haciendo ustedes, sobre todo María José, para que los maestros estén confiados y vuelvan tranquilos al, al centro y puedan darle el servicio de calidad que, que tienen que dar? Eh, ¿Cómo protegen a los maestros? Yo, en primer lugar, creo que hay que partir siendo, haciendo un, un homenaje, en realidad, en el caso nuestro, a los miles de maestros, educadores y educadoras en Chile, que durante todo este tiempo, sin haber mediado eh, un aviso, fueron capaces de subirse muy rápido a, este, a esta crisis y han buscado dar las mejores respuestas. Yo creo que esto ha sacado lo mejor de los maestros en el país. Eh, la gran mayoría ha hecho esfuerzos que impensados por poder acompañar a sus niños eh, y a las familias. Particularmente en el caso de las educadoras de párvulo, han hecho un trabajo importante por llamados por teléfono, eh, prácticamente son eh, atenciones personalizadas con la familia y eso es muy notable. Sin embargo, cuando nosotros decimos que, que, que va a aumentar o que la desconfianza o hacia el sistema, no, no, desde lo, no desde la calidad, sino desde el punto de vista de la seguridad y la salud, la creemos por parte de la familia, pero evidentemente también por parte de los maestros, por parte de los educadores. ¿Qué hemos hecho? Bueno, por una parte hemos trabajado un documento importante de orientaciones que van desde las de higiene, exigencias de higiene, de salud, con algún apoyo de recursos para eso, como orientaciones que van a permitir eh, modificar muchas estrategias, muchas rutinas al interior de un establecimiento para ayudar a la seguridad de los educadores y profesores. Creemos que el sistema cuando pueda volver, debe volver con una capacitación y con un trabajo importante, no solamente desde el punto de vista de seguridad física y de salud, sino también desde el punto de vista emocional, acoger a los educadores y a los profesores será clave, y trabajar con ellos todas estas orientaciones porque son ellos quienes deben en primer lugar sentir que están yendo a un lugar seguro y que ellos podrán hacer muy bien su trabajo. Mm. Sin esa condición creo que es imposible pensar en el retorno, por eso que hemos enfocado mucho el trabajo a que sean los, prof los profesores, los educadores, los primeros en hacerse poder comprender bien todas estas orientaciones, poder practicarlas, poder hacer periodos como de ajuste, con mucha flexibilidad, porque necesitamos que, los, que ellos se sientan seguros en primer lugar, porque son los que le van a dar finalmente la seguridad a la familia y a los niños. Así es que... Eh, Entonces, María José, es... ¿ustedes tienen un manual para esto? ¿Tienen, un, eh, ¿tienen el, eh, recursos? Sí, tenemos un... A ver, ya hay varios que están disponibles. Porque me gustaría, eh, ponerlo, me gustaría ponerlos en el chat o pedirle a Florencia que después lo, lo repartamos. Vamos a poner algunos. El, hay uno que todavía está... que debería ver la luz dentro de los próximos días, pero ya tenemos varios anteriores. Así que uh -huh. hemos hecho el de priorización curricular, el de higiene y sanitización, el de seguridad, etcétera. Todos, la gran mayoría de ellos, en conjunto con el Ministerio de Salud, por supuesto, y los vamos a, y los vamos a disponer acá. Perfecto, súper, muchas gracias. Tien, hay muchas preguntas. Uh, there are several questions whether uh, you have data for the for our region, uh, because we talk, you know, about the, 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 the global uh, finance of your studies. Do you have data for our region? Uh, yes, we do have data. Uh, I think um, we can talk about different types of data. There's, um, I think, uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, one of our big sources of data is household surveys, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. big national surveys to go because I think um, looking just from a facility perspective, you sometimes miss the whole population. So there are good household surveys, perhaps not as much as in other uh, you know other parts of the world, but there's good data. But I think I think what's really good in 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 the Latin America Caribbean is that perhaps ministries of health have a slightly more robust. Um, you know, data collection system. So we can actually look at, at what the ministry, you know, is perhaps seeing as well. So I think, I think right now, I think the hot topic for everyone is to look at routine data and see exactly how utilization of services have changed. Correct. I think, um, I think, I think, I think there are sources there. It's just a matter of being, getting access to the data, maybe waiting another month or so to see real changes. 
and then doing um, robust uh, statistical analysis. On okay, Tim, what I, what, what, what I didn't say properly is that uh, this article by the Washington Post, uh, it's based in, in, in a good deal on your research, isn't that right? It's, yes, it is. And I think, uh, I think um, Florencia can share the link to our, our paper. That's what, I want to, that's what I want to ask. Yeah, perfect. Um, but I, I, I just say that that, uh, that that study was based on scenarios like what we th think could happen. But as I said, I think now is the time for, for ministries of health to look at what is actually happened mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, to, and, to, and to analyze it that way. I think yeah, that's, scenarios is past. that's Tim, it's a, it's for a conversation. I mean, it's a super important topic and it would take us more than an hour to know what's going to happen in the future with uh, data tracing in these kind of situations that we're having now in Latin America. Um, I have other questions. Let me, let me ask at least a couple more. Um, okay, Susan, uh, Iris Palomino is asking uh, this uh, important and complex question. So I'm, I'm warning you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, she, she says, well, how we can actually design strategies if we have in general uh, weak pre-existing services? Uh, uh, and, and she's, she's reflecting about the, the, the Peruvian case, but in general, she's, she, she wants to know how can we reinforce what was already a little bit weak uh, in, in terms of uh, coverage and services. Yes, um, I, I, I think there's been a lot of very, very- I think that Iris is on my, on my camp, I think, on the- <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I think this is what we struggle with even before the, even before the pandemic. We struggle it, yeah. with yeah. How, how robust our service is and can we actually ask services to do anything more? Um, so particularly in terms of early childhood and parenting, we're always facing this because people will say, well, you know, um, maybe the services aren't even do it, achieving the, their, their current goals and you're asking us to ask community workers to do this as well. You know, so I think you, have, I mean, you, what you know, the strategies have to be very much take adaptable and take context into, into account so that you, you, you have to do the things that you think are feasible in, in the context in which you are. I mean, if, if the, if the, this, the only, you know, it'll be a struggle to provide basic health care and immunization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm maybe that's what you should make sure you do well. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? but, if, but if you're just, you know, it, and many times, you, you know, there are ways to, 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 to make, integrate things. And if it's possible to do that, then I really would think that, you know, many, many countries in Latin America, compared to some of the other low and middle income countries, are not doing so badly. <laughs> in their services sometimes it might not you might not seem seem that way if you're in the country <laughs> but they're not and some in many cases they do have the capacity thank you uh, to, to reach out to parents thank you Susan, for that dosis of optimism that we needed uh, very badly but uh tim uh, susan maria jose <laughs> i was so happy to talk to you uh thank you for participating thank you for being good sports with the questions uh and uh so uh, and thank you to the audience and our partners. It's been, it's been an interesting conversation. I learned quite a bit. And nowadays, that's an important commodity. Uh, Florencia, I'm going back to you. And, and thank you, Florencia, as well. No, muchísimas gracias a todos eh, los panelistas. Fue una conversación fascinante. Tim, María José, Susan, Marcelo. Eh, quiero invitarles nuevamente a descargar nuestra publicación, El alto costo del COVID para la infancia, que mis coautoras, eh, Marta Rubio y Diana hincapié, están compartiendo en el chat, mírenla, está ahí en el chat la publicación, esta nota compila y propone estrategias para innovar en los servicios de primera infancia, algo de lo que estuvimos hablando toda esta hora, y mitigar los impactos de la crisis en la niñez. Lo que necesitan nos escriben, muchísimas gracias y hasta la próxima. Chao. Chao, gracias. Bye. 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 Bye.